Chapter 5. George Gibson. The number of times a catcher is injured in a season is surprising. At one time in 1909, for example, George Gibson of the Pittsburgh Pirates had black and blue marks imprinted by 19 foul tips upon his body. A damaged hand and bruised on, on his hip, six inches square there were a thrown and bat had struck, and three spike cuts. Yet he had not missed a game and was congratulating himself on his luck. Johnny Evers and Hugh Fullerton, touching second, 1910. Lots of people think that baseball is strictly in an American game, but was pop. It was popular here in Canada too. As far as back as the 1890s, I know because that's when I started playing ball around here. Excuse me. Dad had his own construction business, but he was also a great baseball fan and always encouraged me to play. We had four they're pretty good teams in a municipal week, Eakin League, London North, South, East, and West. I began as a catcher for London West in 1898. When I was 18 years old and took look at it to it like a duck takes to water. Lots of times I didn't even wear a catcher's mask in, in those days. I couldn't see clearly enough though through it, so I'd take it off and of course many ease the day. I'd come home with a black eye or a bloody nose. In a few years I was behind the plate for Montreal, which was then and in the Eastern League, I didn't get paid much, but it sure beat eat hauling bricks. <clears throat> See, it was a choice between working all day long on one of Dad's construction jobs or having every day a holiday, playing ball. So my brothers helped Dad with the business, and I played ball. In the middle of the 1905 season, Montreal sold me to the Pittsburgh Pirates. There was an ex ex-big leaguer on the Montreal club by the name of Candy Lachance, who'd had, had been around and knew the ropes. He said to me, Listen, Gibby, they sold you. It wasn't a trade, it was a sale. Pittsburgh probably paid anyone from 4000 to $5,000 for your contract, and you should be able to get at least a 1000 of that. So when I got to Exposition Park in Pittsburgh, I asked Mr. Barney E. Dreyfus, the Pittsburgh owner, for a thousand dollars. Mr. Dreyfus looked at me in a strange sort of way, but and said, "I don't know what you're talking about, son. I paid four thousand dollars for you. For you, I didn't get four thousand and dollars. If you want some of that money, which, by the way, you're not entitled to, you better take it it up with Mr. Hagen and the Montreal owner, not me." Well, it was too late for that, so all I did was make a mental note to think ahead from then on and get what was coming into me when the time was right. Besides, this was my chance in the big leagues, and I sure didn't want to go back to the minors, even if it was with the Canadian team. Pittsburgh had a pretty fair country catcher when I got there in 1905 named Heine e. Pietz. Pietz? He, he'd he been in the big leagues a long time, so long that his arm was almost gone. <clears throat> he used to throw the ball like a rainbow down to second base. For the first time, I got it in a game a few weeks after I arrived. I was in Redland Field in Cincinnati. Later, it was called Crosley Field. They had a spitball pitcher going against us, and I don't get I didn't get any hits that day. But the first time and one of the Cincinnati players got on first base, he tried to steal a second. I rocked back on my heels and threw a bullet knee-high right over the second base. Right over the base, both the shortstop and second baseman, Honus Wagner and Claude Ritchie, ran to cover second base, but the ball went flying in the center field before he, either of them got near it. I was burning up, and when the inning ended, I almost ran to the bench and determined to give them a piece of my mind. See, I figured they were trying to make me look bad. Look at letting the throw go by because I was a rookie. Trying to protect Heine's job is what I figured. 
But Wagner came in, threw his arms around me, and said, Just keep throwing that way, kid. It was our fault, not yours. What had happened was that they had gotten so used to Heine's rainbows that th th any he throw on a straight line caught at them by surprise. I don't know why, but I was never a good hitter. A lot of years I had trouble hitting my weight in my lifetime. Batting average was only three or er, two thirty six. Never could figure it out. It was in for lack of trying because I was got. I always got out to the park early to practice, but it didn't seem to do much good. Here I was, a teammate of Honus Wagner and one of the best hitters to in baseball, and I had trouble getting a loud foul. Once I had, I said to him, Honus, I can't seem to get the hang of it. I try hard enough, but it doesn't seem to do any good. What am I doing wrong? He said, Look, the secret is to follow the ball from the time it leaves the pitcher's hand until it gets to the plate. I liked Honus, so I didn't say anything to him, but that didn't sound like much of a secret to me. Heck, I can do that. After all, I was a catcher. That's all I did it all day long. Watch the ball from the time it left the pitcher's hand until it got to the plate. Big deal. It's clear to me that it must have been something else that Honus did, and he didn't even know what that it was himself. Since I was such a lousy hitter, I had to be a pretty good catcher to sit in the big leagues from 1905 to 1918. Most of the time, I'd throw to the bases right off my heels. I'd never get up, just sit there on my heels and fire the ball. Actually, though, I always figured that thinking was my real specialty. A lot of catchers' jobs is is mental, you know. The pitcher shouldn't have to think about what kind of pitch he should throw. That's the catcher's responsibility. The catcher should learn the strengths and weaknesses of the opposing batters and abilities of his own pitchers and then decide what pitch is best in each situation. The pitcher's job is to do what his catcher tells him to do. Catching's a pretty rough deal, and you better love of it or do something else for a living. Every finger on my right hand has been broken at least twice. I had, have two sons, George and Bill, both of them who are medical doctors in Pittsburgh, and one of them x-rayed that hand. He couldn't be believe the number of times each finger had been broken. <laughs> I used to put it on some ad adhesive tape and keep it on plant while playing. Just tape and two fingers together and make the good at one work at the bad one. Roger Erber's hand in of the New York Giants was the first catcher to wear shin guards. Must have been around nineteen oh eight or so. His first long and high with a it with a big knee flap particularly came up to your thigh. When we first saw a uh, Bruce Hannon, and he, in his new shin guards, I laughed, but Fred Clark, our manager, says to me, Gibby, that's something I want you to get. Clark told our trainer er, to find out what that Bruce Hannon got them in order a pair for me. When they came, boy, they were as big as chest protectors. The feel, The first time I put them on in a game, I got tangled up in them, running after a foul ball and fell down. J I just sat there, unbuckled them, threw them away, and never wore them again. That was a real fine Pittsburgh ball club I joined in 1905. Fred Clark was one of the nicest men I ever met. Was was our manager and left fielder. Honus, this was at shortstop. Tommy Leach at third. Sam Lever and Decon Phillip, who were two of the best pitchers in the league. Both of them won 20 games that year. We finished among the top three in the National League every single year from then and through 1912, including the, when we won the pennant and World Series in 1909. We faced the Detroit Tigers in that World Series, and of course they had Ty Cobb, so I know I had my a work cut out for me. We beat them in seven games. I caught every single inning, and Cobb only had two stolen bases. The whole Detroit team only had six bases when we stole 18. Heck, Honus stole six for us. 
Right after the series was over the next day, Barney he called me into his office. He was sitting behind at his big desk with a blank contract in front of him, and he said, Gibby, what do you want to sign and for next year? I don't want to sign now, I told him. You know, that I'd never signed before February. Well, he said, we had a fine year and a great series, and I just that just as soon as you get this settled for your next year. I don't want to do that, Mr. Dreyfus. I said, if I sign now and you trade me over the winter, then I've got to go over whatever's in the contract. But if I don't sign and you trade me, it gives me an opening to go to uh, the new club, a new club and negotiate terms with them. That's why I'd rather wait. Listen, he'd said. Nobody's going to trade you, and you know it. You caught 150 games this year and seven more in the World Series. So how could we get along without you? And with that, he picked up the contract, the blank contract, turned it around and faced me and said, Here, make it out yourself. Put your own figure in there. All right, I said. I'll sign for $12,000, but I want... At one thing in that contract, you've got to uh, promise me that they, that when you think I'm through and I can't do the job anymore, you'll give me the unconditional release. I don't know whether it'll be one year or ten years from now, but when that time comes, I don't want to sit you to sell my worn out carcass for a lousy eighteen hundred dollars after they you've gotten all the good out of it. See, eighteen hundred dollars was the waiver price then. They'd put a guy on the waiver list, and if any other club claimed him, they they could have had him for eighteen hundred dollars waiver price. I didn't mind if I was traded or being sold for a decent amount, but to be sold for the waiver price was demand demeaning. Gabby, I'll write it it in the contract. He said, "No," I said. "You have." I've always been a man of your word with me. When the time comes when I'm through, whenever that is, just tell me and release me. That's all. It's a promise, Mr. Dreyfus said. Well, that was 1909. One day in early August 1916, I picked up the newspaper and read that Barney, he asked waivers on me, and John McGraw claimed me for the New York Giants in 1800 for $1,800. I was furious. I went straight to the front office. Barney, I said, you broke my promise. Your promise. You want to make $1,800 on my broken down carcass and after you've gotten all the good out of it? Well, you're not going to do it. You may drive me out of baseball, but you're not going to make a dime out of my carcass. He tried to offer me some lame excuse, but I was out of the door before he could finish. Then I phoned John McGraw. Mac, I said, get your money back cut because I'm not reporting to the Giants. I'm going home. Which is just what I did. I became right back here, here in this very house in London, Ontario, Canada. I built this place in 1912, wanted a place to go in the off-season that was out of earshot of a trade whistle, heard enough of them around April to September. That winter, 1916, the telephone rang, the very phone you see right here. I wouldn't have a new one put in for anything. You see, take the receiver, the receiver took off the hook, and then you push the little button on the side. That ring the operator on the party line. There's about 25 of us on the party line. I've been here since 1912. That's how old that phone is. Anyway, it was John McGraw calling. He wanted me to join the Giants next year as a part-time player and coach. Mac, I said, I don't want Barnt. I need to make a dime on me. I gave him a hundred cents on the dollar for twelve years. Now he wants to get a lousy eighteen hundred dollars on my burnt, burnt out carcass, and I won't let him do it. I understand, McGraw said. I think you're absolutely right, but on the other hand, I need you here next year. I need a good pitching coach, and you're the man I want. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you eighteen hundred. 
of dollars to the same I pay Barney, and I'll get even give you your salary for last August and September. How about it? Well, what I could do, so the next March, I reported to Marlin Springs, Texas for spring training with the Giants. McGraw wanted me to help get the pitchers in shape. One of the trainers had heard about these new calisthenics, so McGraw asked me, Gabby, do you think about calisthenics for the pitchers like some of the other clubs are using? No, I said, absolutely not. That's not for ball players, Mac. For yourself, fine. If you want to reduce, fine. But not in spring training. Baseball is different, Mac. We're not a bunch of ballet dancers. We don't need calisthenics. Won't it help get my pitchers in shape? He asked me. I'll get your pitchers in shape, Mac, I said. I'll do it without any of those new fangled calisthenics. What I did was what we always done. I hit fly balls and had the pitchers chase them. I took the pitchers down to a corner of the field and hit the one fly ball after another, just out of their reach. If they caught the ball, they'd get, they'd get a quarter. They'd run and run trying to catch it, but I was, was pretty good at hitting. It's just beyond their range. After so long, they'd lunge for the ball, miss it, and just lie there, too poop to get it it up okay ideal next beats calisthenics any day i stayed with mcgraw for two years managed in toronto in the international league for a year and then in the fall of 1919 the same phone rang again all of all the people they in the world that was barney dreyfus what are you going to do next year gibby he asked me i'm not sure i answered Probably manage Toronto again, although we haven't signed a contract yet. Well, how would you like to manage the Pittsburgh Pirates instead? Just like that, it took me a few minutes to recover from the shock. I don't know, Barney. He has said, seems to me I have a couple of things to settle between us before I could even consider it. Like what? Like in the first place, I said, you broke your promise and got $1,800 for my worn-out carcass three years ago. Second, you didn't pay me my salary for August and September that year. I know I went home in August, but that's on account of you didn't keep your word. All right, he says, I'll give you that $1,800 I got from McGraw and pay your salary for August and September too. What do you say? Well, naturally, I'd say yes, as you know, I'd probably gotten, I already gotten both the $1,800 and the and the back pay from McGraw, but Barney Dreyfus didn't know that, and as far as I was concerned, he owed, owed it to me anyway for breaking his promise, so I became the first Canadian-born league ma- big league manager, still the only th- one, I think, to this day, I managed the Pirates on and off for, for about 15 years and then retired and came back home. Didn't win any pennants, but we came close a few times. Always seemed to fade in the stretch. I have a sneaking suspicion we'd have won those pennants if I could have gotten 10 pit and my pitchers is a little better shape.